Hey everyone, today we've got a specialized rock hopper to build up. I bought this bike off the original owner and this is pretty much how it's been. I've done a couple of little upgrades but I've just used it on some gravel roads and things. So it's seen a bit of use in its stock form. It's got a bit of wear and tear and stuff and there's some rust on some parts that will swap out. Like the factory stem and flat bar. So it's a chromoly frame and as you can see it's got like a bunch of battle scars and stuff. It's just, it's had a good life. So we'll be tidying up the frame, making it look a bit nicer. But I don't really want to respray it. It's a pretty cool bike. This originally came from Calgary. As you can see here, the factory um, bikes shop sticker. Pretty cool. So I bought this here in New Zealand and the previous owner bought it over. I've changed a couple of things from stock, like these pedals. I put some Kenda K-Ride tires on it. They're really good, multi-use tire. Like, pretty good on road as well. I'm guessing the owner got the rack put on from stock. And as you can see here, it's got those reverse horizontal dropouts. Which whenever I see that, I think I'm just going to single speed this bike. So that's what we're going to do today. Sort of see some rust worm and stuff, but overall it's it's not really that bad. It's just um it's seen a bit of use. So gonna strip it down, tidy up the frame and stuff, and then rebuild it back up. Just cutting off the cables and things. We're gonna reuse most of the stock parts that we can in the single speed build. But because it's got biopaste chain rings, I'm gonna swap the chain ring out. You can sort of use biopaste chain rings on a single speed bike if you use like a chain tensioner but because it's got those dropouts I'm not going to use a chain tensioner. Just smacking down the cool stem wedge there. Luckily that comes out. I did swap the wheels as well. I just had some nicer condition Dior DX hubs but it came with pretty much the equivalent um, wheels. They were just like Exage, you know, silver rooms and everything. They were okay but just had some tidier DX ones, so I chucked those on. So this locking nut was a little bit stuck. I couldn't quite get it off here. So I ended up putting the front wheel back in. That just gives us like a little bit of extra leverage, like securing the fork so it doesn't spin. Then that came undone. Not too bad, really. There's no damage to the threads or anything like that. The headset looks like in pretty good condition. You can see here the factory paint has a really cool flake to it. It's got a lot of purple in it. So it'd be cool to tidy up the frame and hopefully show that off a bit more. Although I don't think it'll come up in the video. So the headset's definitely okay. It's just got some old, old grease on it. Just taking off the pedals. I put these on so I know that they'd come off. But I haven't taken the cranks or anything off the bike. I pretty much just got it and then serviced it up. You can see a bit of damage to the pedal there. I don't know if I did that or if it's just something I never fixed before I put the pedals on. Just taking off the crank cut there and then we'll put a little bit of WD-40 in behind the bolt. Then we'll also take off the bottle cage bolts here and then try and get some WD-40 down into the bottom bracket shell. So just throwing some in the seat tube there and then it sort of makes its way down into the threads and everything. If you've got some penetrating oil or something, I know um, PB Blaster is good for you Americans and stuff. But um, WD-40 does a pretty good job too. Otherwise some penetrating oil or something can just help things sort of get freed a little bit. So both the crank bolts come off pretty easily. Just cleaning out the threads, making sure that the the tool's going to go in nicely. This is probably one of the most annoying or stressful parts about the whole disassembly process. Making sure that the tool goes in nicely and everything and then hoping that the crank puller tool actually pulls off the crank arm and doesn't just pull the threads out. Taking off the chain now, I use a little bit of WD-40 just to help the chain tool. 
if you've broken some of these pins before, you know, um, a little bit of WD-40 just helps them live a little bit longer. Popping up the chain. This thread here on the derailleur didn't feel that great. I'm um, hoping it was just dry, but um, the threads and stuff look okay. So it'll be good to put a derailleur back on at some point. It had these ZFL, I think they were the ZFL ones, the plastic hose clamp um, for the rear pump, or like the frame pump, but it didn't come with the pump, so I'll have to check if one of them fits in there. We'll be using the stock cantilever brakes as well. These ones can sort of take V-brake pads. I'll show you what I mean later on, but they, they don't really fit properly, but they do a good enough job. And it means you don't have to get like the old, old brake pads for them, but they're quite a strange size. So a bit of filth and everything back there. Just taking off the non-drive side crank arm now. Didn't really have any issues here. The tool went in nicely and everything, and it just pulled the arm off. And then we're going to go through and try and remove the bottom bracket. This non-drive side is a plastic run. Some of them are alloy and everything, but this is a plastic one. The drive side didn't want to come out there. Pretty common for the tool just to pop off with a bunch of force. So we bolt the tool on just using the chain tool. <laughs> Um, you can use some washers or something, but because I just used the chain tool, decided to use that, and it worked great. Getting some extra force on there, just by standing on it. Didn't need to use like a big crazy lever on it or anything. Um, a scaffolding bar, about a meter long, does a really good job at getting out tough bottom brackets. That's just the sticker there on the bottom bracket. One of the last things on the bike is the bottle cage. These can be really tricky as well. As annoying as it is, such little bolts, they get stuck quite often and then the head just snaps off and then you end up having to drill them out. Luckily these weren't stuck though, so that's pretty good. This is a specialized bottle cage as well, so nice little part to save. And that's the bike all stripped down. You can see it's filth from, from me riding it. And just general scratches and stuff. It does have some down to the best steel and some deep gouges in the seat stays here. This is the frame weight, 2.65 kilograms. It's without the fork on it. We're just gonna give it a bit of a clean up outside. This is just some soapy water, just to get rid of like most of it. You can see the, the frame, it looks like it'll actually tidy up pretty nicely. We're not gonna go ahead and like paint over the rust patches. We're just gonna sand them down and leave them raw. We're just gonna clear coat the frame after that. It's so got a few different grits of sandpaper. A couple of the worst sections here, I'll show you sort of the process. So with wet and dry sandpaper, we use a little bit of WD-40. You can just use water or something though, but WD-40 seems to lubricate it a bit better. So using 600 grit sandpaper, just seeing how that attacks the rust and everything. We want the rust completely taken off, so back down to bare steel. But we don't really want to damage the frame's paint too much. So the 600 does a pretty good job at that. We just sort of careful you can keep the sandpaper sort of centralized over the rust. And again here, this is, it's not really down to the bare steel, but we're probably going to have to take it down to that. You can see uh, some of the little spots are, but the WD-40 you can see here, just with like nice clear on it, the paint should pop like a little bit better. So a couple of spots now down to bare steel, just because the scratches were so deep in them. Yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool. 600. Going over, just because you can sort of see like in the edges of the scratch there, there's still some rust in there. Just trying to get rid of the most of that. 
You can sort of see on other bits of the frame as well, there's some rust worm. I'm not too concerned with that. You can sort of see here, sort of around the Specialized logo, that there's a little bit of rust worm. We're just going to go over that pretty quickly with some 600 grit, and that'll just break the paint and then sort of sand away some of the rust. So it's probably not going to look too different. But you can see here some of the bits of paint has been taken off and the rust is removed. So that's one way of getting or dealing to the rust worm. You can also just break into or break through the paint and then just sort of treat it as well if you don't want to remove the paint. Then after that we're just going to go over with the 800 grit over the whole frame. You can feather out the deeper parts and stuff a little bit further if you want but this is pretty pretty well how I like it you can test it what it will look like with the clear coat just by wetting the frame so some WD-40 or something you can see here this is it with like WD-40 wiped over it that's pretty well how it should look with clear coat so a bit of frame prep, prep now we're just going to go over the whole frame with isopropyl alcohol this cleans off all the WD-40 and all the debris and stuff from sanding. So if you've sanded all evenly, it should look pretty dull. So there's a couple spots I need to go over there, but after that's all done, I'm going to throw some clear coat on. This is a Rust-Oleum clear coat. I don't really normally like Rust-Oleum, but this works pretty good. In the past, Ross Oleum for me is sprayed really awfully and then it ends up clogging up and just looking terrible, but this is actually looking really good. Especially on the down tube there, it looks really nice. It kind of looks funny over some spots and on the top tube decal it didn't look great for some reason. Don't really know why. So I did sand over lightly with 800 grit over the decals. You can see here, I don't really understand why. Maybe the clear coat was a bit thinner here. Like the factory clear coat and then I broke through that. And then the new clear coat reacted with the decal. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. So I did three coats of clear coat over the frame and fork. And it looks a whole lot better. You can see like the, the factory um, metallic come through as well quite nicely. Just going to go through and clean up the headset. I decided just to pull out all the bearings that we can like clean in the cage and everything. It's probably more efficient just to replace the cage and then, you know, just get new bearings for the, the headset, but this has still got plenty of use left in it, so I don't really see the point. Just cleaning up everything, putting the balls back in its cage, <laughs> and then we're going to go through and re-grease it. Just filling up all the valleys and everything. And giving it like a wipe on the outside. Before putting it back in the headset. This next step might seem a bit like overkill. But I go around the entire lower race. With some grease. This creates like a, an air seal. That way water and stuff doesn't get inside the head tube of the bike and just sit there. So the only way it's going to get through is through the top, but if you do the same then in theory that water shouldn't penetrate through the grease. So here I'm just checking all the bolts and everything that we're going to be reusing on the bike for rust. And then we're going to clean them up and then throw them in some of our rust overnight. So here are the main rusty ones here. Like These are brake bolts and we're going to use a cable hanger for the headset because we're stopping it, we're swapping out the factory stem. Just some evapor rust in a regular jar. Don't really have too many parts to evapor rust, so the smaller the container, the better. I'm gonna splash in a little bit and then just leave it sitting overnight. Good thing about a jar as well, it's got a really nice lid, so it keeps the evapor rust from evaporating away. Giving it a bit of a shake. And then we'll set that aside. Going back to the rest of the frame, throw some grease in the lower and the upper, then we'll get the fork on. So doing the same sort of 
grease seal here again. That just gets all squished in when you put the headset back together. So you can see it there like all squish out of the bottom and then when we do the top down you'll see it all. Yeah lovely. So that butt won't go to waste we can throw that in the bottom bracket for when the bottom bracket goes back in the frame. This is it after the vapor rust. So you can see it's taken the rust off but it still looks pretty awful because this was chrome. So the rust damage to the chrome will always be there but at least it's not gonna end up falling apart. Just throwing some clear coat on there before we put it back on the bike. You can lightly oil it or something but I feel like clear coat just works a bit better. Tightening that down, adjusting everything before locking it in place. So you can see there on that cable hanger there's a little bolt missing to actually hold the cable but I put that back on later on. Handlebar we're using on the bike is the Magic Components Moth Bar. I fell in love with this bar on the Nishiki so I really wanted to get another one. The stem we're using is a Nitto Techno Technomic stem. I think it's about a 90mm. So because of the difference in materials it looks really different. So this is the Magic Moth Bar in raw but it's clear coated so it's not the polished one but even so the Nitto stem doesn't quite match it. Obviously it'll never ever be a perfect match for the, the bar because it's alloy compared to the chromoly steel handlebar but polishing it up sort of helps match it a little bit better. If the stem was a little bit darker then it wouldn't match it like perfectly but at least we can match the shine to each other. So that's it all polished up. There's still some deeper scratches in it and stuff but looks pretty good overall. Here you can see on the bottom part the unpolished section. That was just with some auto sew real quick just by hand. So I've rode this handlebar on the Nishiki Alien for quite a while now and I'm, I'm loving it. It has like a little bit of flex depending on what stem you use. But I'd say for with most custom bikes and everything, you're always going to have like some inherent flex just because of the cool stem. But the bar itself feels amazing. Really like the back sweep and the width of it. I'm quite a tall person. I don't know if it'll suit everyone, but really cool cruisy handlebar. I do want to try the crust Ron's ortho bar at some point, but I think this probably suits me a bit better because it sort of sweeps forward before it goes back, but it doesn't look like the crust one does. So, hmm. might suit some bikes a bit better though. So got that all installed. Some more grease for the bottom bracket shell. <laughs> Looking really cool now. We're just gonna set the handlebar angle. So they feel best angled down just ever so slightly. It sort of helps you from slipping forward on them a bit. It doesn't really look like it in this video, but you can sort of see that they're angled down just a little bit. So just kind of scoot it around the yard or something and then see how it feels. You can always adjust it later on. Got to do some brap brap noises. <laughs> really cool looking handlebar. So the single speed setup, we're going to be using this White Industries freewheel. This is just on a regular Sounds pretty cool. It's just on a regular, sorry, regular freewheel wheel. So this would have had a seven speed freewheel on it. I've swapped it around before. So this bigger washer would have been on the drive side before, but I just swapped it to the non drive side. And then I would have dished the rim over a little bit. But I'm not going to show all that because it's already done to this wheel. But pretty simple to do really. The chain line might be a little bit whack but it's worked great for me. So it should work pretty good for you as well. 
taking out the bearings now. We're going to wipe out the hub. Make sure it's all good to go. Looks pretty filthy in there, but after some quick little clean out, it looks really good. You can see there's some grease on there, so I serviced it at some point, but just washing out the bearings with some brake clean. The cone looks pretty good. You can see there's one tiny little mark here. Shouldn't really cause any issues though. And this is a rat bike after all, so it doesn't need to be perfect. <laughs> In all honesty, you probably won't feel that little rumble anyway. Throwing some grease in both sides here. This helps keep the bearings in place, so when you're dropping them in, they don't fall out immediately. I don't know why you wouldn't put grease in before putting the bearings in, but there you go. Just getting them in both sides there. I feel like a flathead screwdriver just helps guide them in. You can just pop them in. From there, just put like a little bit of extra grease in. So in the free wheel, we just drop a little bit of oil there. Spin it around. These are a serviceable free wheel as well, so pretty good item. I bought this one for about $15 used um, because the previous owner said that it probably won't take a new chain, but I've tested it on a new chain and it's holding nicely. You can get new um, gears for them and everything though, so fully rebuildable free wheel, pretty cool. Putting the hub back together now, and then we're gonna adjust the bearing preload. So you want it to spin, spin smoothly. The quick release probably will pull in a little bit extra tension, so just keep that in mind. You don't want it to be tight. Just spin nice and smoothly. Love the sound of that, that free wheel. And on the front, we're gonna be using the Dior DX hub that I had. Tires, we're using these Fairweather Dirtlanders. These are based on the old Panarasa Smoke. No, Panarasa Dart, <laughs> sorry. Really cool tire. They're still made by Panarasa, as you can see. Really cool looking tire. I've wanted to use some of these white tires on a bike for a while, but I didn't really know which to use them on. But I think something as boring as the black frame is needs some kind of pop to it somewhere. So I thought mm, the white tires would look pretty good on it. Pretty cool, pretty cool. See these are a folding bead. <laughs> Having some difficulties there. I had to use tire levers to get to that point and then just using my thumbs for the last little bit. Flipping them up. I think I got to about 40 PSI, but they can do it like a bit higher, but I'll be using them on road, so don't need to go too soft. Taking the chain ring bolts off now, and then we're gonna throw that single speed ring on the cranks after we clean them up a bit. All the bolts came out all nicely. So these are just the factory Xage cranks. We're gonna give them a little bit of a polish as well. Some of the old Shimano cranks are anodized, so it's actually pretty cool that these are not anodized, so we can just polish them easily. So like the old XT 7-speed cranks are anodized, so it's a bit more of a mission. You have to like cut through the anodizing to polish them, but these you don't. Just some brake clean and a bit of scrubbing. Coming up pretty good here. So one way to test if they're anodized is use it like a little bit of polish, because the polish won't hurt the anodizing. Then basically if you use some autosol or something and you create the black everything, which is the alloy like cutting, that means that they're not anodized. So because we see that, we know that they're not anodized, then we're just gonna go over with a little bit of sandpaper just to sort of help get out some of the scratches and stuff because they're pretty, pretty brightly scratched. Just with some 800 then 1200 grit sandpaper just trying to be careful around that sticker, just so it doesn't completely wear it off. So wiping it off to the 800, now we're onto the 1200 grit. 
I just use a bit of WD-40 again to lubricate. And then that's the dull surface. Should be pretty even. But you can see there's a bit of a, a deep gouge. Oh, I don't know what created that big... It's like a dent, really, <laughs> in the crank arm. But um, we're just going to leave that there. You can sort of file out smaller scratches and stuff if they're um, not this bad, but it's a really deep gouge. I'm just going to leave it there. And then afterwards, go over some autosol. Just going over by hand. Looking pretty good. Don't want them to be super polished. You can go up with the bench polisher if you want like a higher finish. But this is pretty much how I want it. So normally I would try and match the cranks to the stem and the seat post. That's looking really good. Gearing for the bike. This is a 38 tooth chain ring and 18 tooth freewheel. So it's pretty low, but um, we've got a bunch of hills and stuff around. So yeah, we sort of need to keep it practical. So normally off-road gearing is 2 to 1, so it would be 38.19. So this is just a little bit higher than that. So we can still take it off-road if we want to, but just going to be mostly cruising around and everything, taking on some little gravel shortcuts and stuff and some gravel track. Probably go a little bit higher, but I wouldn't want to go too much higher really. The headwinds and everything just slow me down, <laughs> slow me down too much. Throwing in the bottom bracket. We're trying the one that came out of it. And we're going to see what the chain ring, the chain line is like with that. So just putting it in the wrong way until the threads drop down. You can normally hear it drop and then going back the correct way. That's just a good way to make sure that you're not going to cross through the bottom bracket. Um, putting in the non-drive side. Taking a little bit of the excess grease off, putting that inside the spindle, and then just a tiny bit on the tapers. Throwing the cranks on, we'll tighten them up and then check the chain line with the rear wheel. Once the wheel's on there, you can check it a few different ways. I normally just eyeball it. Having eyeballed a bunch of them in the past, it works out pretty good. But you can also use like a string line or a straight edge or something like that to get it a bit closer. So here it looks like it's a little bit off, so we'll go through and throw in a shorter bottom bracket. I've got a 110 millimeter to use as well. These are all the bolts and everything out of the vapor rust. Now that we need the brake bolts, I'm just gonna give them a bit of a wipe up and then we'll go over with some clear coat as well. While the clear coat's drying, just give this a bit of a just a few light taps, just to flatten that out. It's kind of risky reforming alloy of any any kind, uh, just because it could crack. It's not like steel where you can bend it a bunch of different times in it at all. It should be okay. Throwing on the pedals now, a bit of grease to make sure that they don't get stuck in there. Then cleaning up the brake calipers. So these are just a plastic coated steel part, basically. So pretty simple, just a bit of a wipe up and throwing the springs back in them, put some grease on the brake posts to make sure that they're going to pivot nicely. And throwing the calipers on. So these only have a spring adjustment one side like most of the old Shimano ones. They pretty much work the same as any other regular canties of the era. It's really just the pads that sort of make these a little bit strange because of those thick pads and they have like the strange adjustment washers so they're kind of a strange size I would say throwing the brake levers on and then go through and hook the brake up so these are MT60 brake levers or MT63s so they have this little reach adjustment screw which is basically just like a little cam shape. It's just got some steps in it to adjust the reach. 
So just cleaning off most of the stuff off the chain with a bit of brake clean, and then we'll get the chain installed. So to set the chain length, we're gonna put the wheel in the forward-most position on the dropouts. So at a safe point in the dropout, and then we'll try and lengthen the chain to suit. You can sort of eyeball it here. So it looks like when I cut the chain, or I took off the quick link. So we need to put on a little bit extra of the chain. So just refitting some links here. Just push the pin back through. Then reinstalling it, and then we can chop it down to suit. Keep in mind, we do have a quick link, so we need to factor that in as well. So about there looks like it should be good. So we'll pop that off, put the quick link, quick link in. Quink link in. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. And then get the chain installed. And hopefully the dropouts have enough to still tension the chain. And they just barely do. <laughs> So just snapping the quick link in, just by pedaling on it and holding the wheel. You can see that's how much tension we have, which is about perfect actually. So we might end up putting a half link in there to allow some adjustment, but you can see the tire needs beading or setting on the bead properly. So on the left hand side of the moth bar, it does have a really cool logo. So to show that off, we're gonna use some clear grips. These are the clear Ori grips. Look really cool, quite like the oil grips. And to further profit off that, we're gonna install some stickers underneath. This is one of my favorite stickers, it's just silly. <laughs> this is from Zetland Cycles in the UK. I made these ages ago, and I think it's extra funny to put it underneath the handle grip. So every time I grip it and rip it, there's a, there's a bit of that there too. I did have this one as well, but it's a little bit too big. So it covers too much of the bar, but on the back side, we can put this Forever 26. Really cool. <laughs> Onto the seat post, we're going to tidy this up a little bit. There's some deep scratches in the back side of it. If these weren't so deep, I would go through with a file and clean them up a little bit. But I don't really want to reduce the diameter of the seat post, so I'm just going to leave it as is. Cleaning up a little bit of WD-40 just to get off some of the grime and stuff from the top part. A little bit of grease in here to make sure that this is going to go on nice and smoothly and the bolt's not going to get stuck and, you know, gall up the threads and everything. So tidying up the seat post itself, just a bit of WD-40, and this is a red scotch bright pad. This is more or less a replacement for steel wool, so this is a synthetic wool. This one is quite abrasive, it gets rid of all the debris and stuff, and it scuffs out some of the scratches. So just so you know, if you have the same bike, it's a 27.2 seat post. Then going over that with some auto sole. You can see the deeper scratches there. They're on the back side of the post, so don't bother me too much, really. I've got this cool specialized saddle that I want to use on the bike. It's quite wide. It's pretty comfy for me, so I'm going to throw that on. This is from a later model rock hopper, the alloy one. I think the... The S logo on it suits the bike as well. Pretty cool. And it's a pretty cruisy looking seat. It's not super skinny, but should be comfy enough. A little bit of grease on the seat post and in the seat tube. Then my toothbrush. Not <laughs> that's my old toothbrush. It's not my current toothbrush. To push the grease down into the seat tube a bit. that in there. I got one of Gary's turbo stickers on it which matches the Rock Hopper logo pretty well and his Rat Bike Power one as well and then a couple of others from other friends and stuff. Going over to the front brake now we're going to show you just what I mean about this weird brake pad situation. So getting the front cable cut out to length 
you can see this is just that little cable stopper. So this is a Diacomp front cable hanger mount. Quite like these, pretty cool. But I think they still make them as well, so you can get them new. But this is just one off an old bike. Throwing the front cable in. You just want like a nice curve to this, you don't want it too crazy. So that's the factory pad in my right hand, and that's a new pad. That's just a regular generic V-brake pad. I do have cool stop pads for the rear of it. Um, you can see, you can sort of make it up if you use the washers, the fat washers on the inside of the caliper, like against the rim. So I think these brakes would be best to use a wider rim. This is just like a regular skinny rim for mountain bikes back in the day. And these brake pads, they have to be on a bit of an angle to make them hit properly. You could use some washers and stuff to space them a little bit, but you end up running out of thread on the post. So just keep that in mind. Um, you don't want to use cool stop thin line pads as well because they're just too narrow. So you can see here with the cable set a little bit too long, I'm going to shorten that a bit. And then retesting it. That feels about right there. This non dry side pad is off a little bit so you can see here the sort of the angle that the pads end up being on these calipers not 100% perfect but definitely workable then we'll set the cable hanger ideally you want something underneath this as well with an aggressive front tire if that front brake cable snaps the straddle cable is just going to ping straight down and lock on the front tire I then realized that I had the cable hanger, so it was hitting the lower headset cup, so I had to flip that around. And then just trimming the cables down and crimping on some cable end caps. From there the bike is pretty much all done. I put on a couple of extra stickers and stuff, and then weighed the bike. So 12.46 kilograms, that's without a rack. I think I'll probably put the rear rack back on just so it's a bit more usable. Then just like a pannier bag. So I've got some of the Gary stickers on there, the Rat Bike Power ATB, and the Stridsland Rise Low Die Whenever. And that's the stickers that come with the handlebar. Really like how the white tires look with the bike. Really happy with it. Just like a nice cruisy single speeder, but really cool bike. Could probably make it a bit faster with some gearing changes, but I don't really want to go too fast on it. I'll talk a bit about bike at the end of the video, but for now I'm just going to take it for a little ride.
So that's about all for today's video. Really happy with the, how the bike turned out overall. I think it looks really good. I'll keep all the original parts with the bike just in case I want to or someone else wants to revert it back to stock another time. The tyres, I'm not sure how they're going to go long term just because they're white. Um, with the mud and everything, I'm sure they'll sort of discolour over time. But after this first ride, the mud came out and you can sort of see in a couple of these clips that the tyres sort of clean themselves, <laughs> to some extent anyway. So you can see in the sun, the metallic flake in the paint really pops, but when it's in the shade and stuff in those early clips, you couldn't see it as much. But it looks really good, tidied up and stuff anyway. I think I would change the gearing of the bike if I was going to do more sort of road riding on this, but I'm really happy with it. Thanks for checking the video out, and I'll see you again soon. Thanks. Bye. Next up, I'm going to do one of the skinny tire bikes that I've got. Um, it's going to be either the Doors or the KHS Triathlete. I've got a whole heap of other road bikes and stuff, but these are the two selections for now. Um, I know road bikes and that don't really do too well on the channel, but I like them as well, so let me know what you think.